For the last couple of years I've been filming with Canon. I really love the camera and the picture quality but I dislike how much Canon is restricting me. And finally I managed to put my hands on Sony. I managed to find Sony A7 IV. You can't find that camera officially anywhere in Europe. The whole Europe that camera is missing. I had to get it from the grey market. I had to sacrifice the warranty unfortunately. That migration from Canon to Sony was the most painful thing in my videography career I've done till now. I don't know, maybe I can describe it as migrating from Android to iPhone. It's really painful. I watch more than 10 hours of tutorials before I'm able to operate that camera. And the worst part is that the first time I grabbed the camera in my hand, it felt like a brick. Like Canon has really good ergonomics. And the worst part is the shutter button. On Canon, you have a nice angle here and the finger lays perfectly comfortable on the shutter button. Here it feels a little bit uncomfortable. My workhorse lens is 16 to 35, so of course I bought 16 to 35 uh, Sony lens. And what I notice is that it extends, it expands. And that's something I really appreciate with the Canon. The, the lens is zooming inside. Those are some small things that I noticed from the very beginning. They, they make me impression because I'm just migrating from another system and everything is so foreign. So in this episode, I'll try to condense everything I learned from those 10 hours of tutorials and I'll show you all the settings I did to my a7 IV to make it a workhorse. So the first thing is that Sony did an amazing job with all the buttons and the way how they're positioned. You can really customize them and make the whole camera really workable. One thing that really confused me in the very beginning is that indicator here. So you have two rotational knobs here. The first one is changing the different modes, photography, video or slow motion, which makes total sense. But the dial mode on top was really confusing because in the beginning I thought that that line also indicates the mode on top. So I was always putting the camera in manual mode and I was wondering why I can't control the camera. What is wrong? What's wrong with that Sony? How do you control the Sony? And after I was struggling for one, two hours, I realized that there is a second line here that actually indicates the position of the top rotation you know, thing on top. So if you want to go to manual mode, that's the way how you do it. Now, let me show you how I changed some of the buttons to make my workflow easier. So if I press the knob here, down, that one, I can control the brightness. So in sunny weather I select that mod and it makes the display really brighter. When I press the button to the right I'm switching between the viewfinder and the display. I don't use the auto viewfinder option because when you shoot videos it's really annoying, it's constantly blinking. And my favorite setting is the button here. I set it up to go to crop mode. What is amazing with that Sony camera is that the sensor is huge and when you go in crop mode you don't lose video quality. So that 16 to 35, it's turning to 24 to 50 in that range. And when you're filming outside and you need a little bit of zoom, it's amazing to have that capabilities. Now let's dive in the menu and I'll show you all the settings I tweaked. So first we go to autofocus, we go to number three and we turn on the face eye priority IF. Next we go to video, go to number 11. We turn on definitely the grid, so here is the grid. Here we can control how the grid looks like. And here we turn on the emphasize rec display. When the camera starts recording, the only indication is that rec letters here. That option is displaying a red square on the display. Unfortunately, when you're filming outside, it's still really hard to visualize is the camera recording or is not recording. I'm always sticking my nose in the display. I'm never sure is that camera recording. With Canon was a little bit easier that part. Next we go back to autofocus and we go to the transition speeds. So here IF, MF and we come here to transition speed. By default I think it's uh, turned to 5. I moved it down to 4. Like that the focus is smoother and the sensitivity we dial to 3. Next we go to the settings and there are quite a lot of things we have to set here. We go to the monitor and we go here to the display quality and we select high. The Sony display is horrible compared to the Canon. My Canon display is bigger, much easier to work with. All the settings on the display that are displayed, you can control it with the touch. With Sony is not that situation and I don't want to speak about the viewfinder. That viewfinder is horrible. but 
for the other options that Sony provides me, I guess I can't complain, but it's annoying. Now the next setting here, we go to the power setting option. We scroll down and we turn it to high. Auto power off temperature to high, otherwise the camera will be shutting down and it will be overheating. With that setting, the camera mostly never overheats. It's getting warm, but it's not turning off the video. Now let's go back to the setup options and here there are two things we have to activate. So select the anti-dust function, go inside and activate that option. It will close the shutter of the sensor every time the camera is off. That means that when you're changing your lenses, the sensor will not get dust. Next, we scroll up to operation customize and here we scroll down and we activate rec with the shutter button. That means that every single time you press the shutter button in video mode, it will start recording videos. It's really comfortable. While we are still here, let me show you how you customize your button. So you come here to custom key dial sets. So here is for the photography, here is for the videography. So we are in the video mode now, so we come here. And now you can change all the buttons on the camera. So if you scroll down here to the bottom, you have all the four dials and I changed the number three dial to change the ISO. And it's really comfortable because that dial is changing my aperture, that dial is changing my shutter and that dial is changing the ISO. And the cool part is that you have a locking knob on the ISO. So at the moment I set the ISO, I can lock that dial and I know that the ISO will not move. That's really comfortable. From the small buttons, I set that one to the Gamma Assist. I'll show you later when we speak about the uh, S-Log3 footage. Here is the rotational dial. Here is the Finder Monitor button. And here is the Monitor Brightness. So you just go through that menu and you can set up the buttons the way you wish. And here is as well the Lens button. One more thing I set is in the Video menu, I changed the file settings. So I came here and I changed the files to be named by title and I, I changed the title to begin with the A7 IV. In that way I can easily sort through the videos that were taken from that camera. That's really helpful when I'm organizing my project. Now let's talk about video qualities and codecs. That thing broke my brain till I realized what is happening with the Sony cameras. So come to image quality. And the first thing is the file format and the second thing is movie settings. With the movie settings you control the uh, frame rates and you control the bit rate. So that menu is damn confusing. It took me three videos to watch to realize what is happening. So here is the short version. HS is the most comp compressed codec. With that codec, the computers are struggling a lot because the files are really compressed. As far as I got, it's H.265 uh, compression. The XAVC-S is the H.264 compression and that's the one you use. Now, there is a huge downside with the HS compression that in the PAL region, you're limited only to 50 frames per second. If you are in America, you don't have that limitations. You can record in 24 frames per second, you can record in 60 frames per second, but in Europe, you're restricted with the HS codec. So the first three options here work with any kind of SD cards. The options under the SE is the high quality codec where the camera doesn't compress the files a lot. And for them, you have to order a special SD card or to go with the type A SD cards of Sony that are really expensive. I just ordered 128 gigabytes and it cost me 160 euros. The reason for that is that you cannot record slow motion in 10 bit if you don't have a fast SD card and the bit rate is really low for the regular slow motion. So I wanted a little bit higher quality of slow motion and I had to order an SD card. Now let's select the 4K quality and then move to movie settings. So here you have a couple of options. If you want to record 8-bit, you can record in 100 megabits per second or 60 megabits. But we want to record the highest quality, so the only options for 10-bit is 140 uh, megabits. Now let's move to the SNQ settings because they broke my nerves as well till I realize what is happening. So there are two places where you select the frame rates. So here you can select 50 frames per second, you can select 2 frames per second and you're like, what the heck is happening here? And on top you have rec frame rates. So it's very easy. One of the first frame rate is the frame rate 
the video file would play. So if you record 50 frames per second, but you set 25 frames per second uh, the file to play, that means that you're doing two times slow motion. If you record in 100 frames per second and the file plays in 25 frames per second, that's four times slow motion, but you have to set it up manually. You can also do one to one, you can record in 50 frames per second and the file to record in 50 frames per second. In that way, you see the file real time when you're previewing it. And after that on post-production, you can slow it down. So that was the confusion here. Now, if we want the 100 frames per second to be visible, we have to come to file formats and select the HD. And now we would be able to select the 100 frames per second. Now, after we do all the settings, like we decide what is our shutter speed, what is our aperture, the ISO, we can go back to the menu, come here to shooting mode, go to camera set memory, and now you can save your settings to any of those 1, 2 and 3. Those 1, 2 and 3 are representing the, the dials here on top. So you can save all your settings. And the cool part is that at the moment you move between the different modes, each mod can has each own settings. So everything is really customizable. So I customize my settings for slow motion and for the regular videos. And that's extremely helpful. Just check it out. So here on top, at the moment I move to one, I'm recording in 4K, 25 frames per second. I have my shutter speed down to the 180 degree shutter rule. After that, the second one is an HD mode. Most of my YouTube videos I'm recording in HD because I don't need the highest quality, the files are huge. And then I have 4K, 50 frames per second. It's the same with the slow motion. Now let's come back to the autofocus because it's damn confusing. Here on top, you have a small button and it has three options. And when you circle between three of them, it's really confusing. So the first one is the touch focus. But the problem is that at the moment I touch somewhere, the camera will focus that spot, will not indicate it, but it turns the camera in manual mode. That means that the camera focuses on that place and it doesn't change the focus until you don't touch somewhere else. Now I'll touch somewhere else, will focus on that spot and will turn on the manual mode. I kind of dislike it, but it is what it is. There is no way how you can change it. The second mode here is the tracking mode. At the moment I click somewhere, the camera will start tracking that object. So now if I rotate the camera, the camera is trying to find that object and to stick with it. That mode is my favorite one and it's the one I use the most. And the third mode is the touch off. So at the moment I click on the display, nothing is changing. Which is a little bit confusing because if you press the delete button, the camera is toggling uh, touch operation on and off. So here it could be easily only two functions. One thing I really appreciate with the Sony camera is the sound indication right here. With Canon, you don't have it. You have to constantly circle between the different display modes so you see that your microphone is really working. The downside, there is no auto settings on the microphone. You have to manually dial the decibels and you have to pray that the microphone is not clipping, which I don't understand why there is no auto mode. Maybe I still didn't find it. Now, the really cool part here is that above that circle button, you have the function button. At the moment you press the function button, you get a fast menu. So here, 100% activate the zebras. The zebras will show you, are you clipping something? So if I increase the ISO, you can see how the zebras are kicking in and showing me what I'm clipping. The cool part about the zebras is that you have different settings. So C1 and C2 are custom settings. They are very important. And then you can have also different indications with the zebras. Now, why the C1 and the C2 are very important? When you work with S-Log footage, you really need to have the C1 and the C2 set. In that way, you know that you have the right exposure with the S-Log3. I'll come in a second to the S-Log3 footage. Now, the next very important option is the stabilization, the sensor stabilization. You have three options. You have steady, that's the regular uh, sensor stabilization, or you have the active stabilization when you have the sensor and the digital stabilization. I want only the sensor stabilization. Now, here the setting was for the ISO, but I changed it uh, for the face filter. So, when you activate that function, it will smooth the skin on your face. It's a beauty mode, it's like Instagram filter. It's really handy, I'm still experimenting with it. I don't know how much, how often I'll uh, work with that uh, thing. And the next most confusing things were the picture profiles. What the heck are picture profiles? Like, you have 
PP10, PP11, like you have so many PPs. So very short explanation. So those are all the picture profiles that allow you to be very flexible on post-production uh, with your footage. By default, if you're recording something simple and you don't want to spend a lot of time color grading, record without any picture profile. The next important picture profile is PP11. When you select that picture profile, you can see all the information about it. It's the s cinetone Everyone talks about that picture profile because it provides really beautiful colors. The downside of that picture profile is that it doesn't provide a lot of dynamic range compared to S-Log3. Now, let me show you how to uh, select the S-Log3. So, if you dial PP8, that's the S-Log3 with the sgamut.cine. That one is the easier to color grade. You have as well PP9, that's as well S-Log3, but it's a little bit harder to color grade uh, that one. So, the picture profiles I'm using right now is the PP8 and the PP11. But there is a small Javier with the PP8. When you select it, here you can see that the ISO is marked. So you have to go to the ISO and you have to go to ISO 800. That's the base ISO for the S-Log3. If you record with ISO that it's under 800, you get a lot of noise in your S-Log footage. So definitely you have to get an ND filter. Without an ND filter, your shutter speed will be really, really high. What, what else you should know about the S-Log3? You have to overexpose it. So here it should be around 1.7 overexposure, up to 2. If the 2 is not blinking, that means that it's 2 stops overexposed. If the 2 starts blinking, that means that you really over overexposed it. Now the next thing I changed is that button here. Is that button here. At the moment I press it, I have the gamut assist. So here is when the gamma display assist is off and here it's when it's on. It will directly show me the colors. I really don't like working with the gray image. I really don't understand what is happening. But when I see the image color graded, I have a really good feeling how the footage will turn later on post-production. Now, color grading S-Log3 footage is not that scary as it sounds. The only thing you have to do is to go to the Sony website, download the free LUT, and after that, when you bring the files to your editing software, just apply that LUT. When you work with log footage, there are two steps of color grading. The first one is to install the normalizing LUT. And the second thing is to go and apply creative LUT to shift the colors. But first you have to normalize the footage. One thing I was really missing with my Canon camera is the ability to save all those settings you apply to the camera to your SD card. Every single time after a firmware update, I was going and applying all the custom settings I was doing the first time with my Canon camera and that's really annoying. The other thing that changed after a couple of days spending with that camera is the way how it feels in my hand. It doesn't feel so foreign anymore so it feels more comfortable. In the very beginning I really hated the combo of 16 to 35 with that camera. Every single time I was hitting my knuckles here on the edge and it was painful. Now somehow my fingers found their way and, and it feels fine. So, I hope you enjoyed that video and it was helpful. Don't forget to subscribe, smile and see you in the next one. Bye!